Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. If you have a Bible, I'll give you a moment. Let's uh, flip to Ecclesiastes 9. Ecclesiastes 9, and we'll start in verse 11 and go through 18. I believe those passages, those verses are also in your bulletin. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, starting in verse 11. And God's word says this. Again, I saw that under the sun... The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came up against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me go ahead and, uh, you may be seated. Let me go ahead and open us in prayer. Lord, give us eyes to see from your word what you want us to see, especially the Lord Jesus Christ and his goodness, even from the book of Ecclesiastes. Amen. If, uh, if you took intro to philosophy uh, in college, you might have remembered something about the trial of Socrates. Um, that's when I learned about it. And If you remember, Socrates was a wise man in Greece, in the city of Athens, and he was known as the gadfly of Athens because he would go around lightly stinging people to wake them up from their ignorance and to embrace a life of wisdom or the good life. He was put on trial officially for atheism um, because he believed in a god without form, unlike the Greek gods, surprisingly, and also the other charge being the corruption of the youth of Athens for his teachings. So a jury of 501 men uh, convened, they heard the case, and they found him guilty uh, for these crimes, and he was sentenced to death. And his friends, including the other philosopher Plato, um, they urged the elderly philosopher Socrates to flee the city, get out of there, um, save your life. But surprisingly, Socrates says no. Instead, he decides to um, stay and voluntarily drink a vial of poisonous hemlock. So why would he do that? Well, one writer put it this way. Socrates saw himself as healing the city's ills by his voluntary death. He died for wisdom, the thing he believed in and cared about most. He died for wisdom. He died to set men free uh, in that city Uh, from their folly and urged them to pursue wisdom and the good life. And his final words to the jury were this. Well, now it's time to be off. I to die and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but God. When I was in college, I found this account incredibly compelling. And as a Christian, it was hard for me to miss the similarities between the death of Jesus and the death of Socrates. Jesus was also condemned unjustly. He was sentenced to death for his views of God and how to live in light of God, a.k.a. wisdom. Jesus was also a poor, wise man. They both died for the truth. So, what's the difference? Are they just variations on the theme? Is Jesus just a different Socrates? Or were were they achieving the same goal, or was there something different happening in these two men? Well, to set the context for our sermon this morning, we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, which could arguably be the most depressing chapter in the entire Bible. (laughs) Um, So 
uh, we had um, the uh, president of Wheaton come and preach the first part of uh, Ecclesiastes 9. It was dark. Then Robin got a little bit of a reprieve. He got to tell us that it, we can go and eat our food and enjoy uh, the life while we have it. And then now we're back to uh, really cruddy, dark stuff. Um, but this is the word of God. There's a reason that this is in here. And I want us to be clear that uh, there's a difference between this book and the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs sets out a very um, black and white kind of worldview. Um, when you read through Proverbs, you hear things like, do this and this will happen. Be prudent and good things will happen. Um, and it's very black and white, one-to-one -one ratio. Ecclesiastes, is, it lives in the gray. It lives in the gray. And it says things like this. You can pursue wisdom all you want, and bad things are still going to happen to you. And let's not forget that the wise dies just like the fool. Wisdom cannot ultimately save you. So what is this preacher doing? What is, this, what is Solomon doing to us here? Um, is he just going through a hard time? Is he depressed and he's trying to pass his cynicism off onto us? Uh, no. No, he's not. He's trying to help us. He's trying to deconstruct all of the false ways that we attempt to find meaning in our lives apart from God. Like Socrates, he's trying to be a gadfly, provoking us to wake up from our ignorance and to steer us in the right direction. It's a virtuous book, even if it is a deeply unsettling one. And his main premise, as you know, uh, is that everything is hevel. Hevel. That's the Greek word for smoke, like the cover of our bulletin or up on the screen, if you can see it a little bit. Um, what it's saying is that life seems to be meaningful and to have substance. But if you were to go and grab it, there's nothing there. It's fleeting. It's here, and then it's, it, it quickly dissipates. That's what our lives are. They're hevel. They're vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. And I think that this is the perfect sermon to do right before we start Advent next week. Hear me out. Um, because sometimes before you can see the light, you need to see the darkness. It's kind of like uh, the painter Caravaggio. I don't know if you've ever heard of this painter. Um, his paintings, especially the ones about biblical scenes, are compelling, not for their use of color, but for the abundant use of the color black. And that makes all of his other colors pop by comparison. It's their darkness that makes the light stand out. And I think that's what's going on here with Ecclesiastes. So let's hear what Kohelet has to say, the preacher has to say to us, because believe it or not, this is the word of God given for us to make us more like Jesus. And by the end, I hope we will see how. And from our sermon today, I believe that we will see that death, the very reason for the meaninglessness of life, is surprisingly also the way to find absolute meaning. So that brings us to our first point, the evil of time, chance, and death. The evil of time, chance, and death. Let me reread verses 11 and 12. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. No one has ever had this as their life verse, I'm convinced. No church has ever had this as part of their mission statement, and no one has ever stitched this on a pillow. If you want to stitch this for me on a pillow, I'll put it in my office, I promise you. But uh, I can understand why you might not want to. As one commentator put it, Kohelet's main point is that there is no way one can prepare for victorious living. No one can prepare for victorious living. The world is not a meritocracy. It's not fair, and it's over too quickly. The teacher sees that as hevel, fleeting, lacking substance, and ultimately meaningless, that's what life is. And therefore, trusting in your merit is a curse. Are you fast? Good luck with that. You still might lose. Are you smart and well-educated? 
good luck with that. There are actually a tremendous number of janitors with PhDs, that's true. And of course, there's nothing wrong with being a janitor, but I don't know anyone who enrolls in a PhD program to get that job. And nevertheless, that's where they land. They are a sad person indeed who expects the world to be fair or to have assurances or the li their life under the sun to have meaning, says the preacher. Time and chance rule your life and there's nothing you can do about it. Wriggle all you want, you will never get out of its clutches. Train all you want to be fast. Read all you want to be smart. Your path won't be fair and it will still end in an evil net called death. And we don't know when it's our time to go. Imagine right now, imagine I gave you five seconds right now to make this decision. You could look above your head and you could see how much time you had left until you died. I give you five seconds. Do you take it? Do you look? Well, unfortunately we don't. Unfortunately we don't have such insight. In fact, we won't know perhaps until the last moment of our lives and sometimes not even then. Like a bird in a snare, it's not, it's not until the snare snaps closed on you that you have the least idea what is happening. That is what your death will be like. Death of fish and birds is different perhaps in degree than the death of you and me, but not in kind. Have the right insurance, eat the right food, take the right pills, meet your daily steps. They all lead to the grave. It makes me wonder if Kohelet's favorite artists, or style of art, excuse me, would have been that Buddhist sand art. Have you seen this? Buddhist sand art? Uh, the Buddhist monks stand around with these little things and they go like this and a, a grain of sand at a time falls out of this little funnel until it makes this huge, beautiful picture. Multicolored, very vibrant. It takes hours, hours and hours to create this huge, intricate drawing. And then what do they do once they finish the, the job? They immediately sweep it away. It's Hevel. And I think they're onto something. Now, obviously, we disagree with much of their views, but our religions share that in common because we have the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon wants us to view our lives that way, painstakingly, painstaking, sometimes beautiful, very, very temporary, and devoid of ultimate meaning because they are all pointing towards the grave. Likewise, the ancient Egyptians had a proverb, and they said it this way, every person dies twice. Once when they bury you in the ground, and the other is the last time someone says your name. Even in the New Testament, James says it this way, James 4, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Personally, I'm trying to get into motivational speaking. How am I doing? You guys think, is this, is this working? Um, obviously, I had a tough text, but my job is to preach the text. Um, and if you're feeling really heavy right now, that's good. That's exactly where the preacher wants us to be and what to feel. But remember, his painful goadings are trying to steer us in the right direction. He is trying to deconstruct all of the false ways that we find meaning in our lives apart from God. It's painful to have to let go of our security blankets, especially the more false they are. I actually had one this week. Mine was comfort, and I had a week of terrible discomfort, and it was, this was a real lesson to me. I, I actually got a lot out of the sermon uh, as I was preparing it. Um, but sometimes our security blankets aren't even the ones we're expecting. Sometimes it's even something like wisdom itself, and that brings us to our second point, the hevel of wisdom. So the first point, the evil of time chance and death, and now the Hevel of wisdom. Um, Hevel, as you'll remember, is the Hebrew word for smoke. And what the preacher is trying to get us to see is that even wisdom, even wisdom, how to live the good life, even that is Hevel. Now the preacher paints for us a word picture using many of the same words that are actually in verses 11 and 12. And he then puts them into a story here for us. Uh, and it's a story showing the evil of time and chance 
and where wisdom is ultimately meaningless. So let me reread those verses for us again, those 13 through 16. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. As we can see, he recounts an event where a poor but wise man defeats a strong army by his wisdom. But no one pays attention to him and his wisdom is ultimately rejected and forgotten. Notice that the battle in this story, like our first verses, it doesn't go to the strong. The battle doesn't go to the strong. And wisdom also doesn't produce wealth. This is a poor, wise man. And in one further fascinating parallel, the word the preacher uses for siege works in Hebrew is actually just a variation of the Hebrew word for net, which is what the fish were snared in, an evil net. So this is a very cool trick that biblical writers often use in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They use the wrong word with a purpose. These are not mistakes, but big arrows alerting us to something that they are trying to do. So Kohelet is clearly trying to link these two sections, verses 11 and 12 and 13 through 18. So here's what the preacher sees. He sees a strong king come up to besiege a small city, but a poor wise man saves the city by his wisdom. It's an amazing underdog story. And how does the saved city respond to being saved? Did the city want to elect this person as their leader? Did they want to write a song about his great accomplishment? Did they want to build a statue so that he would be remembered? No, he was not remembered and they forgot him. There have been attempts through history trying to identify this anonymous person, but that of course misses the point. The point is he wasn't remembered. But it's a little bit like Socrates if you think about it. He was a poor but wise man who through wisdom was seeking to save the city of Athens, and it doesn't go well for him either. The small city's takeaway was not for them to seek wisdom, the very thing that the poor wise man used to save them, but instead they start pursuing military might. They go after might, like their enemies, the very thing that the poor wise man was able to single-handedly defeat. And ironically, the very writer of our book today, Ecclesiastes, Solomon, his leadership follows the exact same trajectory as he moves from trust in Yahweh to trust in his military might. You can trace that through his life. The very thing the king of Israel was forbidden to do. It's so tempting to stop trusting God and to start trusting our objects of force. We stop caring about what God wants and we become hellbent on getting whatever we want and through any means at our disposal. And often when humans go down this route, ironically, they think that they're doing it for God. And sadly, as verses 17 and 18 show, sometimes all it takes is one sinful leader to destroy much good. Let me reread re uh, verses 17 and 18. The words of the wise man, or sorry, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Now to be a fool here is not to be stupid or to have low intelligence. No, you can be a very smart fool. No, fool here is a, a moral category. To be a fool is to be sinful. Its foundation is a lack of trust in Yahweh and a false belief that you need to exert your own will as if you were God. It's the opposite of true wisdom, which the Bible says the starting premise is the fear of Yahweh. The fool doesn't fear Yahweh and therefore answers only to his or her sinful desires. You don't need to be a history buff to see that this is a well-worn pattern from humans' time here on earth. A loud, forceful, political leader rises atop an increasingly foolish and sinful populace, and they run headlong together against the will of God. Of course, you have textbook like Hitler, Mussolini, but if you go back, you have Caesar, Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh, even Nimrod all the way back at the Tower of Babel. And it's as sad as it is predictable. 
And this mindset is drawn to the strong man, or the biblical term is mighty man. It looks towards a strong-willed, arrogant human being to bring about the world how we would like it by force. The demagogue disregards what God really cares about, even though they may pay lip service to him. And that's why the fool has to be loud. He can't rest in God's strength, but must try to increase it for himself. He must try to get people angry and amass an army to fight about the things he is angry about. He must become a god unto himself, claiming that he alone is the decider of good and evil. And tragically, the godly wise often have to stand by and watch the train wreck happen right before their eyes. One such godly wise man was the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. As you probably know, he was a faithful pastor who tried to warn others against the evils of Hitler as he watched him rise to power, as he watched more and more of his beloved country fall under Hitler's tentacles. And his warnings fell on deaf ears even as Hitler slowly took over and demolished his own denomination. His fellow pastor after fellow pastor bowed the knee to an in allegiance under the threats of Hitler. And despite all of wise Bonhoeffer's warnings, one sinner destroyed much good. Yet Bonhoeffer remained faithful in the face of that evil, even to the point of dying in a Nazi concentration camp. As Bonhoeffer noticed, more and more of his countrymen falling under the spell of Hitler, he made some astute observations about demonic power that starts to control people within a society. And he wrote about it in a short essay simply called Of Folly, Of Folly. And I'll read you a brief quote from that essay. In speaking to the fool, he says this, one feels somehow, especially in conversation, that it is impossible to talk to the man himself, to talk to him personally. Instead, one is confronted with a series of slogans, watchwords, and the like, which have acquired power over him. He is under a curse, he is blinded, his very humanity is being prostituted and exploited. Once he has surrendered his will and become a mere tool, there are no links of evil to which the fool will not go. Yet all the the time, he is unable to see that he is evil. Excuse me, that it is evil. Here lies the danger of a diabolical exploitation of humanity. So at the time of Hitler's rise to power, Germany was actually, believe it or not, the most Christian nation up to that point on earth. And they also had more PhDs per capita than anywhere at that time. And they were taken headlong by foolishness. We as Christian people in America need to ask ourselves if we are being taken by such foolishness. Are we willing to be wise, humble, and faithful to God, even as foolishness gains power around us and destroys much good in our land? Or are we not? Are we willing to trust God that much? Or will we be citizens like that city and pursue force to get what we want and join in the foolishness and evil ourselves as our hearts wander from God? Even the author of this very book, who is warning us, sadly followed that same path. Solomon's heart was devoted to Yahweh, but his wealth and his military might increased, and he wandered further and further away from God, the wisest man in the Old Testament, blinded by foolish faithlessness. This is the shock of Ecclesiastes. While it is pro-wisdom, it also concludes that even wisdom is hevel, smoke, vapor, meaningless. Why? Because as with the case of Bonhoeffer, wisdom often loses in this world to foolishness. The poor wise man is forgotten. Socrates is forced to drink hemlock. Bonhoeffer is hanged by piano wire. Wisdom is good, yes, but it is vulnerable and so often loses to the strong-willed, loud-mouthed fool. And wisdom's ability to be defeated by foolishness is hevel, says the preacher. Also, wisdom can't save you from your death. Wisdom, how to live well, is ultimately meaningless. It is good, yes, but it can't ultimately fix the world. You can live as well as you possibly can, and it cannot prevent your death. 
If you are looking to wisdom as the answer, don't bother. Wisdom, like folly, is hevel. This is what the preacher said back in Ecclesiastes 2. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why have I been so very wise? And, why, and I said in my heart that this also is vanity. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity and a striving after wind. Everything is vanity including wisdom. So, what do we do? What do we do? If wisdom can't help us, is there any hope for our lives of hevel? And that brings us to our final point. A death that cured hevel. So point one, the evil of time, chance, and death. Point two, the hevel of wisdom. Point three, when death cured hevel. As you probably know, here at Westminster, we believe that the Bible is a story about Jesus. Or to use a fancier term, it is Christocentric. And that is exactly what I think is going on here in our passage. Yes, the writer of Ecclesiastes is making his own point, and it's a good and helpful one, but I think there's something more going on in this text as well. Let me explain. We don't know who who Solomon had in mind, but it also seems to describe Jesus as that poor wise man, doesn't it? Let me, let me make my case. Jesus was poor, like the man in our story. In fact, Jesus was homeless. Jesus was wise as opposed to trusting in military might and weapons, so much so that it confused many of the disciples who wanted a violent warrior messiah. And he went, underwent death to save a city, Jerusalem, and that city rejected him. And then there's this really curious connection in the text that I'm going to try to bring out to you right now. You tell me what you think. So just as the words in verses 11 and 12 were then played out in that story in verses 13 through 18, I think there's also an intentional link here to the life of Jesus. So in verse 12 of our passage, notice this phrase. So the children of man are snared at an evil time. But in Hebrew, it reads like this. So the sons of man are snared at an evil time. Jesus had a favorite name for himself. Do you know what that was? It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't the Christ. It wasn't Messiah. It was son of man. He used it way more than any other title for himself. And if you search the Greek word snared in verse 12 um, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it was used by many people in Jesus' day, including the New Testament writers, it returns a single hit from the New Testament. That same word from the Old Testament in our passage returns a single hit in the New Testament. And it was from our New Testament reading this morning. So let me reread those, that uh, passage for you, our New Testament reading this morning. Luke 11. When the crowds were increasing, and see if you notice any parallels. When the crowds were increasing, he, meaning Jesus, began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. And he went away from there, and the scribes and Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things lying in wait for him, to catch him in something he might say. That word, to catch, that's the single hit. It's the same Greek word as the Hebrew word snare, Uh, in our uh, Ecclesiastes passage. The Pharisees were setting a snare for Jesus like a bird. But also notice son of man. That's also a parallel. And also notice he describes the generation as an evil generation, like the evil net. And finally, what ate Jonah? Not a whale, but a fish, the other animal listed in our passage. Personally, I think there are intentional parallels going on here in Ecclesiastes 9-12 and what is going on in Luke 11 by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus is talking about in that passage is the most important parallel between this passage and the life of Jesus, and that is his death. His death, that was the sign of Jonah. That's because this passage is talking about death and hevel, and Jesus was the cure for hevel. His death was the cure for hevel. So, 
uh, a little bit later in Luke, the angels tell the disciples when they go to the empty tomb, they say this, he is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The resurrection of Jesus alone, alone, takes the meaninglessness out of death. Jesus bored a hole right through the middle of death and came out the other side. And with that single act, he destroyed hevel. And because of that, life is no longer meaningless for the Christian. He not only took the hevel out of death, but he took the hevel also out of wisdom. Now, living by God's wisdom is not worthless, but has eternal meaning. How you live matters eternally. This is what Socrates, however noble, could not do. Socrates nobly and sacrificially died for wisdom, but he could not make wisdom meaningful. He could not take the hevel out of it. Only Jesus does, and only Jesus can make wisdom matter. That's the difference between Socrates and Jesus. This is why Jesus is, as it were, the true Socrates, a death that made wisdom meaningful. So then we, we must ask, how should we as Christians read the book of Ecclesiastes? Okay, we live on this side of the resurrection, so doesn't that just negate the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, no. No, it doesn't. We are not in the same place as the author. If you remember, this is how the book of Ecclesiastes ends. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But you can hear the bit of uncertainty in Solomon's voice about how it can be true that you should live a life of faithfulness to God while at the same time concluding that everything is hevel because it all ends in the grave. You can hear that discomfort. You can hear that wrestling within him. He doesn't know how it all goes together, but we do. The answer is death, the death and resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb is the answer. We as followers of Jesus are blessed to live on this side of the answer. Why fear God and keep his commandments? Because that is what faithfulness to Jesus, the destroyer of Hevel, looks like. But we can also still read the book of Ecclesiastes profitably because as Christians, Jesus' victory over Hevel does not remove Hevel from this side of the new creation. We are still going to die. We still live in a world where the race doesn't always go to the swift. Wisdom can still be shouted down by a foolish sinner who can destroy much good. Jesus' death doesn't remove Hevel in this life, but it radically alters it. It removes the meaninglessness of it all. Yes, life is not fair. Yes, you will die. Yes, an evil leader might ruin your country. But this world is not all that there is. In Christ, your death is not the end of your story. The earth is not your destiny. The earth is not your place of citizenship. For the Christian, this life is full of failures and frustrations, but never meaninglessness. Never, ever hevel. Just because Jesus has dealt a death blow to Hevel doesn't mean that we don't experience it, though, every single day. It is our constant companion. But it is also true that as Christians, what we do in this life matters and will matter for eternity. So with this understanding, the book of Ecclesiastes can be incredibly helpful to the Christian. And it makes it a lot less depressing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what a depressing book. <laughs> The Christian should read the book of Ecclesiastes, both embracing its frustrations of the Christian life under the sun, while also keeping the resurrection of Jesus ever before them. If you do that, you will get a lot out of this book. I have two points of application for us today before we conclude. First, if you are in Christ, your life has utmost meaning. And because our life has utmost meaning, that needs to affect how we live. Focus on heaven where your citizenship is. 
act like a citizen of heaven. What does that look like? Well, it means keeping your eyes on Jesus above the sun and not on the things of this world under the sun. It definitely means not giving yourself over to foolishness. Maybe it means not trusting in weapons, whether literal or verbal. Maybe it means getting off of things like Facebook and Twitter. Maybe it means watching how much news you take in. Maybe it means not getting into arguments with others. Maybe it means not trusting in military might. Maybe it means not listening to shouters. Maybe it means not listening to political leaders who tell you that they are the solution to the world's problems. Only Jesus is that. Beware those false messiahs. Maybe it means not hating people who vote different than you. Maybe it means not elevating politics above religion or confusing politics for religion. As Psalm 146 says, put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Instead, put your trust in King Jesus, the son of man, in whom alone is salvation. All else is vanity and chasing after the wind. All of this has the ability to take you away from God, from what God is urging you to do. Be quietly faithful. God wants you to be quietly faithful where he has planted you. Serve him even when no one is paying attention, like the poor wise man from our passage. Could you live faithfully to Jesus if no one but him noticed? Not even your co-workers, not your children, maybe not even your spouse. Could you be faithful like Bonhoeffer, speaking the truth in love, even unto a gruesome death? That day could be coming. And then my second point of application is this. If you are not in Christ, I'm sorry to say, and I say this with love, but your life is meaningless. If you are not in Christ, nothing can remove the hevel from your life. Jesus is the only answer. And if you do not take him up on it, there is no way for your life to matter now or to matter in eternity. That is the height of tragedy. But the good news, the good news is that Jesus has his arms open to you now. He invites you to trust him. He invites you to eternal life. He invites you right now to a life of meaning and to eternal life. And nothing can take that from you. Not chance, not time, not death, not being meaningless in the world's eyes. When you have meaning in God's eyes through Christ, nothing, nothing can take that away. And nothing can matter more. Will you trust Jesus to give your life the meaning that you know it's supposed to have? Let us pray. Our Father, we feel the weight of living in a world under the sun. We feel the frustrations. We feel the constant ways of being let down. We feel the unfairness. We feel those who, through their trusting in their own might, try to take this world by force. We feel that pain, Lord. But Lord, we also see the way through. We see the whole that Jesus has bored through death to the other side, to life everlasting. And he has made that not only for himself, but for all of us who trust in him. So we pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts to trust in a dark world to see that light and to love you and to serve you and to be faithfully planted where you have planted us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.